Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Madness. Some are born in the darkness of insanity. Others are forced onto it. Some use their insanity to their benefit, going against the grain, having new ideas and being unpredictable, while others are hindered by it, dragged into the depths of their own mind. In the tale of Joanna, perhaps better known as the Mad Queen, it is a bit of all the above. But before I tell the tales of the raving of a mad woman, Nick, how are you and what are you drinking? I was good, slightly nervous, but I am drinking uh, some Kona Brewing Golden Ale because it was on sale. What about you? I'm drinking some Pellington whiskey, and uh, well, Nick, strap in. This is a dark one, so got that going for us. A tale that is a bit disturbing, and I can't help feel some sympathy for the life of Joanna the Castiel, known throughout history as Juana la Loca, Joanna the Mad, the Mad Queen. Joanna was born November 6, 1479 AD, in the city of Toledo, being the third child of Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Elizabeth I of Spain. Yes, the same Queen Elizabeth who would help start the Spanish Inquisition. Needless to say, having understanding and caring parents was not going to happen for Joanna. Joanna, having older siblings and being a woman in this time period, Yona was not destined to rule, rather to be married off and help her family align with powerful houses and help whoever she married rule. In her childhood, she would receive a great education, especially if you're considering this is all happening in the 15th century of Spain. She would learn many languages such as Latin, French, Portuguese. She learned civil law, history, mathematics, and philosophy. Practiced and honed etiquettes for the time such as dancing, needlepoint, and manners and even took to music, apparently being very good at it. All this knowledge, all this education, made her question the world around her, including Catholicism. During the Inquisition? Yeah, it's not going to end well. I can... Yeah. And when your parents are known as Catholic monarchs, and your mother personally helped start the Spanish Inquisition, questioning Catholicism is not going to fly in the household. So, in order to correct Joanna for her transgressions or mistakes that her mother found appalling, Queen Elizabeth, her mother, would torture her. Joanna would be hung in the air, weights tied to her feet, and suspended for undisclosed time as punishment. She would also be shoved into dark, isolated rooms to quote, unquote, correct her. Definitely not the mother of year. That's, uh, that's an understatement. What, what, what can solve this problem? Let's just hide it for a while. <laughs> oh, uh, poor choice of words, especially when we get farther into this story. I was going to say, uh, this is the proper technique to dealing with dirty laundry, not people. Dark humor all around. I love it. Yona would be betrothed to Philip, Duke of Burgundy, son of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, nicknamed Philip the Handsome. They would marry her at age of 16 and him at age of 18 in 1496 A.D. This marriage was to help form an alliance between Spain and between Spain and France, which at this time was edgy at best. This was a marriage made in a boardroom and would be a shitty husband at any time in history, I think, once you explain who, who Philip is. That's a broad like that's a pretty broad <laughs> time fr- time frame and you can't find one time it's got the uh, I'm I'm excited to hear about this. In a in a sh- way I shouldn't be, I guess. He's up there for assholes. Uh, but before I get into that, strategy stuck her when her two older siblings would die. Her older brother from sickness and her sister from childbirth. Her sister's son would live, but only make it to about age two and die. All this made Joanna the oldest in her family. And her family without a male heir, Joanna was kind of the one to be. I also want to point out... Joanna would have a younger sibling, a sister, that she'd see only one more time after her sibling's deaths. Back to her husband. 
Her husband, Duke Philip, in short words, was a sex-hungry dick. After Ioana's brother's death, and I'm talking right after his death, Philip would literally take up her brother's title, Prince of Aragon. And I'm talking like the wedding, the funeral hasn't even happened yet. Identity theft is not a joke, Mike. It gets worse. He would also only care about Ioana at a physical point. He cared about more about her looks than anything else and only used her in lack of better words, as a whole. He would consistently and constantly cheat on her with other women, and from what I could gather, Philip believed that women should be seen and not heard. Philip, also rather on purpose or a secondary condition to his personality, would many times simply desert Joanna, and boy, that's talking about giving someone the cold shoulder. Well, all this, and this is like the first year and a half of their marriage. I want to point this out. Well, this didn't sit well with Joanna. She was outraged having bursts of anger and fits, which people at this time simply deemed her as crazy, you know, as a byproduct of being crazy and being raised by crazy people and marrying an asshole. It kind of drove her to become crazy. Is this the uh, hysteria, which, and are we at the point in history where we treat hysteria with orgasms, or is that in the future or the past? That is in the... That is in the future, which I bet by the end of the story, you wish Joanna would be able to time travel. Joanna would start having mental breakdowns, where she would literally throw herself into walls, cry herself to sleep, and, based on the rumors, dive into witchcraft. I just have to ask this question. Do we know how much she weighed? (laughs) Ha! More than a duck, I presume. So then she's not a witch. Correct. Okay. For punishment for... Uh, Joanna throwing herself in the walls, crying that her husband's cheating on her. He deliberately deserted her for a while. I would also like to point out, during Joanna and Philip's marriage, she would be pregnant most of the time. And Philip wasn't just cheating and trying to hurt his wife, but his pregnant wife. And he didn't really care that much. Like, for example, in 1498, Joanna would give birth to a daughter. And in turn, Philip would call her a failure because she didn't give birth to his son and did not want to pay or support his daughter. And Joanna, for a large portion of her life, would grow up poor, even though it was being royalty, simply because Philip did not want to pay for daughters. They would have six children together. Apparently, and take this with a grain of salt, for I had a, time, I had a hard time verifying this information, while in her native home, Philip would leave to the outer reaches of his territory. Ioana, now fully suffering from mental issues, would cry and mumble to herself, simply wanting to go see Philip, but can't standing to be away from him. Her mother and father, evil as they are, actually tried to help her by keeping her away from Philip and keeping her in the castle for her health. For all her parents' faults, they actually did hate Philip. And when the woman who started the Spanish Inquisition hates you, either you're a Jew or they actually are a piece of shit human being. Yeah, there's... There's not a lot of options there. It's like, uh, yeah, the devil's like, oh shit, that guy. (laughs) (laughs) Ioana would continue to cry, mumble herself, and have mental breakdowns, and her parents had no idea to do. They let her go to Philip. Big mistake. Ioana would find that Philip had taken up a mistress, which, when she discovered, did not like, and apparently stabbed her in the face with scissors, repeatedly killing her. And in turn turned to witchcraft slash the devil to make love potions to have Philip love her and only her. But again, this evidence is more rumors and scarce at best. So you, it can't be confirmed that she was doing that? Or it can't be confirmed that that's what he thought? Can't be confirmed about her witchcraft. She most likely definitely stabbed a girl in the face with scissors repeatedly. That's, yeah. The witchcraft is Witchcraft and devil worship is the only thing that uh, I... Sometimes you got to go for a Hail Mary. Is it is it witchcraft or is it just like little kids who are bored ma- putting a bunch of stuff in a, you know, bucket like this is soup now? Uh, actually, it might not be too far off because at this time she would be close to 20. But soon in 1504, Ioana's mother would die, making Ioana the queen to be with her other two siblings dead. One of the most powerful people in the world. Her father, Fernandad now having no ties to the kingdom of Spain because he married into it, turned against his own daughter for the power of the kingdom. 
proclaiming that Ioana was too sick to rule and he should continue ruling. Philip, now realizing that he is the king-to-be of Spain, did not want to get nudged out by Ferdinand. So, in order to counteract Ferdinand, Philip started to begin to mint coins that had Ioana and himself presented as king-queen on them to solidify them as rulers and spread them throughout the kingdom. Two years later, in 1506, Philip would die from typhoid fever. But rumors spread... Oh no! Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, a deadbeat father who uh, would kind of abuse his wife, cheat on her all the time, and uh, quite literally call her crazy witchcraft and pretty much torture her. Oh no. But rumors spread that Ioana's father was the one who actually poisoned him to help him fight for the throne, which I can either confirm nor deny, but I wouldn't put it past it because catching typhoid and dying it really quickly is kind of rare. Ioana's father took control and confined Ioana inside of a palace and removed all her loyal servants so she didn't have a voice. But in his efforts to solidify him as ruler, he would do his own undoing. He would marry the French Germaine de Faux, which would piss off and enrage the people. See, like I said, at this time, the Spanish and French, they really hated each other. And his new marriage, it was to a French woman. So this new marriage gave Ioana a massive favor to become ruler because all the people were like, no French people, Spanish only. Ioana, you are now our ruler. Seems like a, a good rule of thumb. <laughs> Well, now with her siblings dead, mother dead, husband, even though awful, dead, father imprisoning you, and a real possibility of mental illness running through your family, Ioana, at her husband's death, went to true madness. She would have her deceased husband dug up and would bring the corpse and the coffin everywhere she went, to dinner, from palace to palace, and yes, even the bedroom. This would carry on for years until she had Philip reburied outside her window, where she could look out the window and see his grave. No hard feelings, though. I want to point this out, because later on in the podcast, I'll be bringing it back up, but there is speculation that all this was a plot and a political move, simply not to remarry and help remove her father from the throne, using a corpse to scare off any suitors from trying to marry her and take her throne, which, you know, a woman in grieving because she's now a widower, and if she were to remarry this time, the husband would have more say than her using her madness as a, as a ploy to show off how cruel her father was so she could retake the throne, and that Philip, even though dead, was the true king, not her father, to me is a stretch. But sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. But also, I, 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 I'm just imagining there's nothing. I mean, I've seen pictures of medieval rulers. I imagine there's nothing that could scare someone, a, a dude, away from the throne. Like, oh, I don't want to marry that widow, or she's crazy, or being an actual royalty. I, in ancient times, like, I feel like that's kind of a stretch, too. Well, I'll bring it back up again, but I actually think there might be some merit to this truth. But if I was a betting man, I would have to say that she was actually crazy. Probably suffering from psychotic moments that was passed on by her mother, or caused by her mother, one of the two. Uh, so in... Uh, apparently, so of uh, some of Ioana's children would do the same, and I imagine it has to do with the incest that was rampant in the monarchy lineage throughout Europe. That probably didn't help, but I'll get back to that in a moment. What, what's something that's uh, classy if you're rich and trashy if you're poor? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one. But back to the tale. In 1516, Fernand would die. No more father, no more husband, just her and the throne. So Ioana would put her son Charles V on the th on the throne, which was a mistake for like father, like son. Charles would also be an ass. In 1520, a few a couple years after Charles becoming king, a revolt of the Camoneros would ensue. People who wanted Catholic monarchs to rule and have strict Catholic morals. So they turned to Ioana which I find hilarious because she was quite literally tortured for not being Catholic by her mother. But they came to her and turned to her to lead them and help her overthrow her own son. Two papers were drawn up, one in support of the Camoneros and the others damning their cause and supporting Charles. She signed supporting her son, a man who would, who would imprison her to help keep the country from devolving into chaos. 
The rebellion failed not only by battle, but also by pen. Charles, now worried that his power will always be under threat as long as his mother was around, would in turn keep Joanna locked up, having people watch her 24-7, not even let her look out the windows. And, by Charles' words, it seems to me that is the best and most suitable thing for you to do is to make sure that no person speaks with Her Majesty, for no good could come from it. End quote. All of the rest of Ioana's children would become rulers and hold positions of power, but none would really come to her aid. Ioana would live the rest of her life isolated, locked up, and confined, supposedly not being allowed to near windows, and only light would come from is candles. She would die April 12th. 1555 at the age of 75. Now I return to the possibility that she was not insane but rather using her madness as a ploy. I could not help but think of the story of the man in the iron mask. Hiding or imprisoning your rival, claiming that you are insane, that you shouldn't listen to them. Charles may have locked away his mother because she was insane, she was a danger to herself and others, or perhaps he locked her away to prevent her from being a threat to his power, for she had more claim than he did. Both have merit, but none shall truly know the truth. If Ioana was insane, I understand why. Through bloodline, childhood, and the cruelness by others, insanity is an easy thing to fall into. And if Ioana wasn't insane, the cleverness of her poi is astonishing, and I say bravo. Either way, Ioana, the Mad Queen, was a queen, a woman, born into the chaos of the court and monarchies. And... Some words heavily associated with monarchies, royalty, riches, war, incest, and of course, madness. A word that would define her for the rest of history. That is the story of Ioana, the Mad Queen. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on